Part two of session 34, and let's finish this talking more about catalysts and polarization. Let's begin. So far, we've talked about catalyst programming and polarization in regards to harvestability and specifically third density and how that is uh, related, obviously, to our day to day life, to our experiences. And that to me is like really important because that helps us to put into practice how all this metaphysical knowledge and all this uh, abstract thinking or uh, realization of, of reality uh, really you know help us to deal with our with our reality with our experiences with our you know common day life so I think these are really important questions and um, rather insights that we get for how this really works I'm going to try since we get you know deeper now into some examples like Martin Luther King and Albert Schweitzer and General Patton from uh, Second World War. Uh, we have some some really good information that we can put into context, knowing what we know already about the energy centers and how we polarize them and everything else, you know, within this model of the law of one. So uh, that's to me really important, as opposed to uh, some other transient questions that we do get from time to time. I actually, you know, to be honest, I enjoy the law of one, you know. Uh, through and through so but I guess I'm just putting emphasis on this as regards to the practical aspect that we have for uh, experience in life you know and how to feel ourselves how to gauge ourselves you know in terms of if we're being distracted or not so we're gonna get into a lot of those questions so in any case let's start with the question that I had uh, left out uh, in the last video 3410 Don says, if an entity were to be strongly biased toward positive societal effects, what would this do to his yellow ray in the aura as opposed to an entity who wanted to create an empire of society and govern it with an iron fist? What would be the difference in the yellow ray activity of these two entities? So the question now goes, just to get a refresher, into how would it look for a positive entity or a negative entity in terms of their yellow ray development and um, you know Ron, Don says an empire of society and govern with an iron fist that's the negative one negative one and what would be the difference between you know the yellow ray activity of these two entities a positive and a negative one and here is where Ra gives the examples of MLK and uh, Albert Schweitzer so they start with Schweitzer Ra says, let us take two such positively oriented active souls no longer in your physical time space, meaning they're dead at that time. Um, and they keep saying the one known as Albert, who went into a strange end to it a barbaric society in order that it might heal. This entity was able to mobilize great amounts of energy and what you call money. This entity spent much green ray energy both as a healer and as a lover of your instrument known as the organ. This entity's yellow ray was bright and crystallized by the efforts needed to, pr to procure the funds to promulgate its efforts. However, the green and blue rays were of a toweringly brilliant nature as well. The higher levels, as you may call them, being activated. The lower, as you may call them, energy points remain in a balanced being quite quite bright so Schweitzer is a great example of a positively oriented uh, individual who really uh, energize its yellow ray energy center they say and I think it's it's really uh, notable that they say um, it was crystallized yellow ray was bright and crystallized that means that um, his perspective of uh, of reality within you know the the yellow lens was so pure that obviously you know development and activation of green and blue were 
almost perfect too. I mean, there was so much energy flowing there. Remember, if we have we have if we have yellow ray crystallized, that means that our lower or the lowest ones, red and orange, are flowing with a lot of energy. I mean, there is very little or, or no blockages. That means that all the energy is going to the heart and the throat in our chakra system. So that's the first thing to note. Schweitzer, for the little research that I did, because I, I, I didn't know anything about him until I read it in the Law of One, um, he was, you can see the genius in people when they have the talent for art, specifically music. I believe music is one of the most beautiful arts because it, it represents so much the flow of nature in, in terms of harmony. And he was a genius in, um, in, in music. In, uh, he was able, I, I believe one of the things that he did was uh, being able to note or notice the, uh, the perception of some paintings in terms of the, or the music in terms of painting. There was something about the visual that he would see that his instructor, I believe, was like baffled by because he never thought about, you know, this type of uh, association. So, you know, as a musician, he was a genius, but also he felt the call for uh, medicine and healing people. And that's why Ra says this entity was able to mobilize great amounts of energy and what do you call money because uh, that was uh, for his effort in, you know, healing people. Uh, like I said, I didn't, you can read about him, Albert Schweitzer. I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, hopefully I don't forget. <laughs> Uh, I tend to do that, but um, yeah, if you want to read more about him and see what a strongly or a crystallized uh, yellow ray um, entity looks like or looked like back then, you know, we're talking about 17, 1800 and uh, 1900 century. So I believe around there he was born in 1870 and I mean, he died pretty old age, if I remember correctly. So um, he was alive up until pretty late in the um, in the 19th century. So, and they also say, however, the green and blue rays were of a towering brilliant nature as well. So see, once the yellow ray of a positively oriented um, individual is crystallized, meaning that it has a, um, a really good perception of other people as himself, and it doesn't have to be within the philosophy as we see it. It's only a perception. It's a feeling of wanting to help other people. Um, it's it's almost like that's why I call it instinctual. It's a it's a bad word because instinctual we associate it with animals, so so it's almost like a reactive thing. But that's probably the best word I can use for this reactive reactivity that we have once we have. A, a certain perception. It's automatic. I mean, you can't go back. <laughs> uh, what's been seen cannot be unseen, you know? So the higher levels, as you may call them, being activated, the lower, as you may call them, energy points remain in a balanced being, quite, quite bright. So uh, the lower centers were quite bright and the higher levels were uh, being activated. So in house, and see the terms that they use, uh, green and blue rays were of a toweringly brilliant nature. So as the energy is flowing from the lower energy centers and it's um, and it's just brilliantly you know empowered by by this, you know your green and blue rays are going to just be shining a lot. So um, you know this of course, what this means is not you know in terms of visuals, obviously we're talking about, uh, his perception of unconditional love and wisdom as in an acceptance too. I mean, there's so many things that Albert Schweitzer here depicts to us in is that perception of self and other selves in terms of love and wisdom, because that's uh, essentially what we're looking for when we, we want to, uh, to allow this energy to flow is that it's not impaired by our blockages in our lower energy, lower energy centers. And as we allow this, then that energy can be spent in seeing reality from a loving perspective and wisdom, balancing it with wisdom. That's why the two of them work together, four and five. 
uh, green and blue, they work together. It's our mind in the esoteric representation of it. Our body is the lower energy centers, red, orange, yellow. Our mind is green, blue, which is love and wisdom. That's what our mind is for. And then the rest is spiritual, indigo and violet. So uh, again, really good example here for um, uh, without even knowing too much about uh, Albert Schweitzer, you can just see how somebody um, manifests that way in, in our human reality. So, all right, the next example, Ross says, the other example is the entity Martin, Martin Luther King. This entity dealt in a great degree with rather negative orange ray and yellow ray vibratory patterns. However, this entity was able to keep open the green ray energy and due to the severity of its testing, if anything, this entity may be seen to have polarized more towards the positive due to its fidelity to service to others in the face of great catalyst. So here we have another example of somebody who we do know a lot about because he was a popular uh, figure and um, you know all the uh, all his actions are very well known in the United States and even you know globally he's uh, he's pretty well regarded I grew up in Venezuela and I assure you that I heard about him since I was you know uh, I was a youngster so his teachings or his views of the world were uh, were global so and then a couple of things I want to clarify here because this this can be uh, misinterpreted and the way I see it, I've, I've heard a couple of interpretations and I, um, I, I see the direction that they have, but I, um, I see something different here. Let's see. Ross says, the other example is Martin and this entity dealt with a great degree uh, in a great, words are important here. This entity dealt in a great degree with rather negative orange ray and yellow ray vibratory patterns. People may interpret this as, you know, oh, he was being negative because he dealt with these patterns, meaning that he uh, he used these patterns. That's not true. People may say, uh, well, you know, he had to deal with, you know, uh, the influence of these things. That's partially true. Or he was around people who were, you know, negatively oriented. That could be true as well. I don't know. But the way I interpret this is that he had to deal with the circumstances of a great degree of negative orange and yellow ray. We know his work was about equality in not only uh, the black race, but in poverty also, and other you know sort of um, e equality uh, philosophies, and you know everything that he talked about justice as well. Uh, in in so many ways, this was his work he was confronting in his time a lot of negative orientation around him like the i mean he was uh, he was murdered so <laughs> you can see that there was a lot of negativity in his work as opposed to albert schweitzer see like albert schweitzer was dealing with a different experience he was a healer he was a musician he was involved in those um, in that scenario obviously i'm not saying one is better than the other they both served but it was a little bit more harmonious say for Schweitzer than for MLK because he was dealing with a lot of uh, racism of course discrimination and um, threats all this negative stuff that was going around him he had to deal with that so again if we read it they say this entity dealt dealt in a great degree with rather negative orange ray and yellow ray vibratory patterns of course and the more for him to be able to use this you know to shine because he was dealing with a very negative environment which uh, we're also gonna get when we talk about war I'll mention something similar I talk about Muhammad Ali um, in the last video I think it was and you know they keep saying however this entity was able MLK uh, was able to keep open the green ray energy and due to the severity of its testing See, the testing was all the experiences that he was having, the surroundings, the environment in general. 
If anything, this entity may have been seen, may be seen to have polarized more towards the positive due to its fidelity to service to others in the face of great catalysts. See, they say again, testing, uh, severity, severity of testing and great catalyst. So all these things are experience. You know, one, what's testing him if not the environment? What is the great catalyst that he was facing if not the environment in which he was involved? So that's what they mean, you know, with um, dealing with a great degree of negative orange ray, uh, orange ray and yellow ray. Once again, orange meaning uh, identity and obviously, you know, discrimination, yellow ray power over others, which is uh, slavery <laughs> and the rest of all. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about slavery as we knew it, you know, uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. I'm talking about slavery as we know it in terms of monetary uh, um, discrimination and the way, you know, we are enslaved basically by the matrix. So, you know, that that's all things that he realized. I mean, MLK was way beyond, you know, the surface uh, understanding or comprehension of society. He was very deep into knowing what the system was about. So, you know, it's uh, and you see, you can you can notice that two people um, in in different yellow ray circumstances how they um, they react and how it's um, it 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 affects them in 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 their polarization as um, as they open their green ray because you know they he had even though he was dealing with a lot of that he continually opened you know because he was service to others oriented so all right so um, the next question is just because Ra talks, it's funny, because Ra, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll make a mention after this. Uh, Don asks, you know, get, to give the names, the last names of Albert and Martin, which we already know is Albert Schweitzer and Martin Luther King. And I'll just say that it's funny because I, I tended to have that, uh, I would call people by their first name. And uh, funny, I remember a story when I was, was reading uh, uh, Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire. And I was talking to my friend, you know, talking about the author, uh, George uh, Martin. And uh, I just said, George. And he said, what do you mean, George? Like, you know him? And I'm like, I'm sorry. I, I meant Martin. You know, we're talking about George Martin, so I can call him George, right? So Rob just used the first names and <laughs> forgot we have last names. So um, I know what that feels as a human. So next question of importance. Uh, Don says, I thought that was correct, but I wasn't sure. Can you give me the same type of information that we have been getting here with respect to the unmanifest self interacted between self and gadgets, toys, etc. Inventions. So, a uh, refresher from two videos ago, we talked about in session 33 and in the last video too, questions about catalyst that is presented by the unmanifest itself, that is catalyst that is uh, unrelated to other self interaction. That was Don's initial question. Other than other self's interaction, uh, catalyst through that interaction, what are the other types of catalysts that are produced by the self? And um, one of them was the self in relation to societal uh, other selves, meaning self with third density situation, tribe, group, society in general. And this was one of them, our relationship with toys, gadgets, and uh, inventions and so on. So now Don is asking again, within, within that line of questions that were about the manifest itself, the self in societal uh, self, and now with gadgets and toys, we're going to get into war as well. Again. So Ra says, in this particular instance, we again concentrate for the most part in the orange and in the yellow energy center. In a negative sense, many of the gadgets among your peoples, that is what you call your communication devices and other distractions, such as less the less competitive games, may be seen to have the distortion of keeping the mind body spirit complex unactivated so that yellow and orange ray, orange ray activity is much weakened thus carefully decreasing the possibility of eventual green ray activation. I think this is important now more than ever. 
because um, as seekers, what we're trying to do is to have as much catalyst as possible in terms of the um, the experiences that we have so we can allow the energy of this experience to flow through the lower energy centers and up to the heart and our throat chakra which is the mind we are developing the mind in essence here we came from animals we're now humans and we have consciousness so what do we develop our mind and our mind is the heart and the throat in terms of the chakras love and wisdom so if there is not enough energy flowing through that there's not enough uh, intensity going through the the uh, the fluidity of the energy is not powerful enough then we have a weak mind a weak heart and uh or love and wisdom balance so in terms of and this is again 1981 they were talking about just uh, the technology back then this remains and they say okay uh, negatively in a negative sense many of the gadgets among your peoples that is what you may call communication devices that would be uh i mean now we have this monster which is a communication device of all possible ways i mean everything is encapsulated there uh, people's lives are in there which is crazy um, it, it's just, I mean, I'm not addicted to it, but I, I know the possible addictions that are created by this and I depend on it a lot. So you can see in your own uh, self how much we have put our value of the life experience into these devices. Now, back then they were talking about only communication devices, say it's like TV, radio, and so on. Um, there was no internet back then, of course. So such as the less competitive games too. Those are the games that keep you kind of numbed and we are well known for that. I mean, if you see in my back wall, I am a, um, a remnant of this. <laughs> so I played all my life, you know, non-competitive games. And uh, this may be seen to have distortion of keeping the mind body spirit complex and activated so that yellow and orange ray activity is much weakened, say. So it's not creating blockages themselves, it's just not allowing the energy to flow. There's not enough experience because you are numbed by, you know, this. And I mean, when I tell you, I'm, I'm saying, you know, by experience, I used to spend hours and hours on end, you know, 12 hours a day or more, eight hours a day, uh, just playing video games. And uh, nothing against video games, of course. I mean, I would be very cynical to talk about video games, you know, in this way. Uh, but, you know, used in this way, it just weakens it. And that's just the truth. I mean, see, um, here's the distinction where you, you know that you do what you want to do, but you must be aware of what's happening and what you are uh, depriving yourself from. So, thus carefully decreasing the possibility of eventually green, green ray activation. Of course, how can you possibly open your heart when you are dealing with synthetic experiences that are... Um, just artificial they are there you know they're they're providing you entertainment and distraction yes um, again I'm not saying anything against it I would be very cynical once again but it is what it is you know the more you spend time you know doing those things and I still play video games I'm not gonna lie you know the more um, you spend you have to know what you're doing so that is what's causing uh, a weakening of those energy centers because it's not allowing you to have those experiences that's just how it is so, Ra goes on with more information about this and say, uh, others of your gadgets may be seen to be tools whereby the entity explores the capabilities of its physical or mental complexes, and in some few cases, the spiritual complex, thus activating the orange ray in what you call your team sports and in other gadgets such as your modes of transport. These may be seen to be ways of investigating the feelings of power, more especially power over others or a group power over another group of other selves so um see there's there's another side of this again and um i guess i i'm biased to interpret it this way when they say others of your gadgets may be seen to be tools whereby the entity explores the capabilities of its physical or mental complexes I'm talking about computers maybe or uh, any sort of technology gadgets i associate them with technology itself that um, allows the development of you know the physical 
and the mental complex because we're we're using our minds and our uh, our bodies to uh, to devise these things and to to work with them too. So it's um it, you can use it both ways, I guess. You know some some of the stuff, and in some few cases the spiritual complex. I'm not sure how that could be done. Um, I can come up with examples, but I'll be speculating, so I won't. Thus activating the orange ray in what you call your team sports and in other gadgets such as your modes of transport. Uh, modes of transport, I'm not sure what they mean. Uh, I read somewhere that it could be um, like say modes of transports or cars or vehicles and you know racing could be that or it could be also association of ourselves with say sports and um, vehicles. Uh, I don't know, people who have fascination with cars maybe, I don't know. This may be seen to be ways of investigating the feelings of power, more especially power over others. This could be, the, the, I think they're talking about sports here because sports, it's a competitive thing. And you know, you you can see that mentality of the, um, uh, the I'm not gonna say all of them, but the, the reigning mentality in sports is to be, you know, to dominate the other. So you're exploring that. I'm not saying you're polarizing towards the negative if you play sports but you are exploring that and you're seeing what, you know, how does that feel? You know, did you play sports and you beat another team? And, you know, did you feel sort of compassion for, you know, their mistakes and so on? That's fine, you know, that is that is a way to explore it. Did you feel like you own them and, you know, they're, they're dirt and whatever? I mean, you're exploring that negative, you know, possession that you are superior and all this stuff, so. It's it's exploring yellow ray and orange ray um, activity. So again, the question had to do with this. So sports can be seen that way. Um, again, going back to the vehicles, it could be if not about sports, then it could be you know uh, my you know my possessions. Maybe I don't know. My car is better than yours. I don't know. I really don't know. You know what they meant, but my, uh, by uh, modes of transport. Um, and yeah, so you know, it's really how you use this for uh, for experiencing love and and uh, wisdom. There could be you know a, a way in which you use video games for that. You know, if you're using a cooperative you know game with other people and you do things for them so they can feel happy. Who knows? I mean, there's so much to go into this that it's not uh, to say that something is good or bad. And I, I wish, you know, at this point, everybody would transcend from that mentality, that dualistic mentality, just seeing what the opportunity presents to you to, uh, to use it, you know, for, for, for polarizing yourself, not even polarizing, forget that word. It's just for having an experience, you know, having an experience and how do you feel reflected in that? So I think that's uh, it's good enough analysis of these questions for, the time being, Don says next, what is the general overall effect of television on our society with respect to this catalyst, 1981 television? Now it's internet. Ross says, without ignoring the green ray attempts of many to communicate via this, vi this medium, such information, truth and beauty as may be helpful, we must suggest that the sum effect of this gadget is that of distraction and sleep more than ever. I'll say it again, this guy right here, this device that we call a smartphone has the potential for both things. Uh, the computer itself, I mean, the computer is kind of phased out, I believe. I mean, I, I'm probably one of the few ones that still uses a uh, old school, you know, tower, PC tower and my monitor as well. I don't know, maybe people who also work, you know, creating videos and so on. I'm just, I smartphone for me was just like an extension that I used for a couple of things, but I wasn't really involved with all of it. Actually, coming out of my shell, you know, as I remember, um, I was not involved in social media. If you check my social media for the past 10 years, I rarely use it. I, I mean, I, I played with it a couple of times, but I was never an avid user of social media. And it wasn't until now that I decided to use it for uh, just expressing myself and that's what I use for, um, that's it, you know. So in any case, um, this is, you know, what's, um, what the effect is. I remember in 2008 is when I re finally realized I never watched a TV guy, watch TV, you know, as, as a mode of, again, you know, distraction. Sit there and watch TV, but 
not too much. 2008 is when I completely unmarried myself from TV and programs and all that stuff. Once I realized what was going on behind the scenes in, uh, in the government and the elite and TV and all this stuff, and I just said, all right, last time I watched TV. <laughs> so um, in any case, so I say uh, TV itself would be a, a, and we, again, I'll keep extrapolating to the internet because that's now our way of communication. Uh, without ignoring that, meaning that, you know, there is some green ray attempts of many to communicate, and this also is Blu-ray, but remember, green ray can only be expressed through the Blu-ray. Um, uh, so, communicate via this medium such information, uh, truth, beauty, as may be helpful, we must suggest that the sum effect of this gadget is that of distraction and sleep. Distraction for the people that are, uh, again, now there's, I'm sure there's people who, um, are addicted to the new TV, which is all the variation of channels like Hulu, Netflix, uh, and so on. I don't know. I, I don't know all the channels. I barely know Netflix. So, um, you know, that's that's another type of addiction. Like, what show is going on? You know, what am I going to watch? YouTube could be another one. You know, that, that there's an addiction to that. Um, so, yeah, maybe pause this video and go outside to nature. <laughs> so. Um, uh, without ignoring, you know, those, uh, uh, those, the attempts of communicate, you know, uh, beauty uh, in information, I believe what I'm communicating, I guess I'm biased, you know, but this is, I don't know, I'm just doing it because I like doing it. So um, we suggest blah, blah, blah. Okay. So yeah, the distraction comes there. You know, how much time do you spend? It's like the video games. How much time do you spend, you know, on a video game that doesn't uh, allow you to interact with other people and to... Um, share information, share experiences. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed, you know, with this generation, probably the past generation as well, um, I'm 38, so, you know, I'm talking about people in their 20s, um, no offense, but it's true, and you might be, you know, related to this, is that there is few human-to-human uh, -human communication. I had to, I worked with people of this age and it was incredible. There was only a few people who could sustain a conversation. Like, I, I, I know I'm gonna sound old here, but um, like the old days, you know, you meet somebody and you talk about, you know, you have a full conversation and it's now more uh, delegated to the phone. You know, I'll send you a text or, you know, this, and even there, there's a disassociation with the, the connection between people and it's just like, um, I would rather deal with you over the phone than in person. How much experience and catalyst is being lost there? Possibilities, again, you know, that will come again at some point. It's just me maybe being an old man. Uh, but there is experience that is there, you know, and I would rather deal, and I always said this, especially at work and uh, with other people that I had to interact with in society, I said, again, I, I feel very old saying this, but I said, you know, let's talk about this personally i feel like there's a lot of a lot of energy going on you know when we talk in person and i'm all for it i'm actually uh, i'm an avid personal you know uh, conversation guy that seems to be you know transformed now there is all about you know just in texting and you know um indirect relationship with others so this is uh, there's a lot of distraction not only from the environment but even from uh, interaction between you know other people you and others and then sleep uh, they don't mean sleep in the, in the way we talk about sleep they talk about sleep in the sense of spiritual sleep uh, when we talk about awakening awakening that this is sleep this is the opposite so you know this keeps you asleep but it can also wake you up so uh, in any case you know it's a uh, I'll I'll just finish up with saying that you know, it's not that something is good or bad. It's how you use it and what you use it for and what is your orientation. So there is no there is no devil or, you know, God or angel or whatever. You know, it's just how you use it. You know, how do you feel about it? And if you're fine being that way, maybe, again, 
maybe I'm, you know, just being this old man saying that we should interact more humanly, you know, person to person when the opportunity is possible as opposed to being afraid of the human interaction and rather using, you know, communication devices to talk to other people. I mean, it helps to connect, but if I'm living next to you, then what's the point? Let's have a personal conversation. And this happened to me a lot. So um, I'm, I guess I sound emphatic because I was, you know, in this situation before <laughs> where there was no human communication. It was rather like, uh, let's talk through electronics and bits. So in any case, I'm ranting. Next question. Don says, can you give me the same type of information that we have been working on now with respect to the self relationship with war and rumors of war? And now we're going to what I said, uh, catalyst provided by ro by war and rumors of war. Ross says, you may see this in relationship to your gadgets. The war, this war and self relationship is a fundamental perception of the maturing entity. There is a great chance to accelerate in whatever direction is desired. One may polarize negatively by assuming bellicose attitudes for whatever reason. One may find oneself in the situation of war and polarize somewhat towards the positive, activating orange, yellow, and then green by heroic, if you may call them this, actions take to preserve the mind-body-spirit complexes of other selves. Ra has more to say, and I'll, I'll leave that after I address this uh, paragraph. Oh. Now we're talking about um, catalysts provided by war for the for the person. How you relate, see, once again, I'm not saying the war is good or bad, um, that's up to people, but it really is how you interact with it. You know, just like teams, uh, team sports, you, how do you feel? You know, do you feel compassion? Do you feel like, you know, it's, a, it's all a game, you know, let's just, you know, have fun, or do you feel like you're dominating others and you are, you know, the, the, the alpha male there, you know, how, how do you deal with that? So with war is the same thing, because you can see, you know, there is, they say there is a great chance to accelerate in whatever direction is desired, because war is like the ultimate way in saying like, all right, we have the situation, what are you going to do? Are you going to go and kill people, throw bombs at them, you know, destroy their, uh, their communities, their houses, their residence? Uh, for you don't need to know the motive just you know be patriotic and you know they're they're attacking us whatever whatever uh, excuse there is for war you know how are you going to react to that now there's two ways of course you know you can refrain from it or you can participate if you participate that doesn't mean that you're being uh, polarizing towards the negative they say one may find oneself in the situation of war and polarize somewhat towards the positive, activating orange, yellow, and then the green ray by heroic actions, you know, sa saving your comrades, you know, your uh, your people, or even saving the enemy, you know, that that's happened. Uh, you realize that it's another human being who is trying, you know, to kill you because of the same reasons, and you realize, I mean, you have a higher consciousness. There's so much that can go within, you know, certain uh, aspects, and, you know, it's... Um, it's a very limited perception to demonize, you know, the military just for that. Uh, I believe that, if anything, the military, um, as a as an industrial complex, yes, is um, it's a negative. It's obviously from the group of Orion, but the people are there. You know, they're uh, just like the medical industry. Obviously, that is Orion group influenced, uh, but the people there are, you know, people who want to do good people who want to do you know good things for the world and for people they're there to serve people they want to do that uh, of course there's always the negatives who are polarizing you know in both ways there so in any case this can be used that way you know um and uh i think it's uh it's it's a beautiful you know catalyst that exists in our in our reality because it really makes you choose in the end, what are you going to do? I used the, the example of Muhammad Ali again, second time I said in this video, but I think it fits perfectly here because of the next slide that we're going to talk about. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's whatever direction you want to polarize is there and it's going to, you know, just imagine having the possibility. It's hard to do it in society if you're evil, you know, because you have morals and all this stuff. In war, there is no morals. You can do whatever you want. You can kill even your, you know, your own um, comrades if you want to. That has happened too, obviously, as the Russians, <laughs> or even the US too, they did it. So in any case, I'm not here to judge, it just happened. So next slide, 
Rag says, finally, one may polarize very strongly third ray. And that asterisk there is because they um, they made a mistake. They meant to say fourth ray, heart. So they say, uh, one may polarize very strongly fourth ray by expressing the principle of universal love at the total expense of any distortion towards involvement in bellicose actions. In this way, the entity may become a conscious being in a very brief span of your time space. This may be seen to be what you would call a traumatic progression. It is to be noted that among your entities, a large percentage of all progression has as catalyst trauma. So um, I alluded to this already, which is the positive polarization that you can have when the government calls for your aid in going to war. And you may say, thank you, uh, but no thank you. <laughs> Uh, again, Muhammad Ali, great example for this. Um, he said, no, I'd rather go to jail, but I'm not going to jail because I'm not, you know, this is not fair. I want justice, uh, you know, and, you know, this is just a great example. So, uh, in this way, the entity may become conscious being in a very brief span of time. Since. I mean, once again, you can see the strong catalyst that is there for people to refrain for, from these actions and realize, you know, what they're doing and saying, okay, no, I'm not going to participate in this, you know, bellicose nature um, that we have. I'm just going to stay put where I am and I'm going to stay true no matter if they want to imprison me, if they want to kill me, if they want to do whatever, you know, you do not want to do that. So it's a, it's a great, think about the consequences once you die, you know, and you realize that, you know, all the bodies that you killed were just bodies. It's just your intention of killing them and you realize and you say, oh, crap, <laughs> I didn't really want to be this way. So now I got to go back and fix all this stuff and I got to deal with the karma and everything else. Or, you know, saying, you know what, you want to kill me? Kill me. I don't care. I'm not going to go kill other people. Boom, you got killed. You uh, wake up in uh, time space and say, oh, nice. I did the right thing. Uh, uh, I took the right choice, took the right path. <laughs> so, you know, you all of a sudden realize that, you know, you just have a, a bigger heart, a shiner, shinier uh, uh, green ray. So it is to be noted that among your entities, a large percentage of all progression has as catalyst trauma. Trauma is a very important word because we experience life as traumatic events. Everything that we have can be caused um, Everything, everything that we carry um, in our in our shoulders, it's weighing us, can be called trauma. Something that we didn't process earlier. So um, this is, you know, the great catalyst. It's there. That's why going through dark nights of the soul, if you're familiar with that, then you know you know what it is to release trauma, to release the that that which you are not, that you're carrying because you think it's yours, because you think you are it. So um, it's uh, it's interesting how they say, right? This may be seen to be what you call traumatic progression because they're not, um, you know, they're not. Uh, I don't see it so much as traumatic. Uh, I would say, but I guess for somebody you know who is denying to participate in war and has you know consequences and very dire consequences, then it could be uh, a trauma, but. They're mentioning that you know trauma is a big thing for us here. So I remember just to since I I seem to be talking about you know my life and anecdotes a lot, so I'll just throw in one more. Is that um, I can in retrospective uh, I can see that I give you a little bit of my uh, background. I was born in the U.S. and I was raised in Venezuela. I left when I was uh, a kid. That's why my English is sort of limited. Um, so I came back when I was over 22, I believe, 22, 23 years old. And I I noticed that I kind of skipped the military. Um, if you know my age, you know that by 2001, where the the war against uh, Afghanistan and subsequently Iraq started, I was ripe for that. I was barely even 20 years old when that happened. So I could have gotten involved back then. Um, not sure if I could have because I have an issue with my eye, which is another story. But the point is that now that I see, you know, in 
uh, into my past, I can see that I could have been there, but I wasn't here. So that, you know, kept me away from it. And not that I would have, uh, I was never into military. Just a funny story again, and we'll keep going. <laughs> I don't know why I keep adding this stuff, but why not? Um, I just, um, I used to be, my friend in Venezuela used to uh, make fun of me saying that I was going to be a really bad American because I was not interested in the military, uh, police, uh, drugs or alcohol, uh, sports at all, uh, cars, guns, all those things that are very American, you know, that everybody has some sort of, you know, background on it or they love talking about it. It's like a, it's like a cultural thing. And I was not very, you know, interested in all that. I was a nerd. <laughs> I was a pretty uh, nerdy person. So, um, you know, I just, I just wasn't interested in all that. So, maybe I wasn't going to go to war anyways. But you know, I guess I planned for it. So I was, you know, not involved in war. But I mean, I, I could have, you know, in 2001. Who knows? But anyways, I, uh, I seem to have program against that. So I'm, I'm grateful for my higher self, my unmanifested self, or whatever you want to call it. Don says, question 3415, continuing with the law of one and not with my life. You just used the term third ray in that statement. What's that meant the term you meant to use? We correct that already. Ra says, we intended the green ray. Our difficulty lies in our perception of red ray and violet ray as fixed. Thus, the inner rays are those which are varying and are to be observed as those indications of seniority in the attempts to form and harvest here is when we talk about color therapy before and we're talking about don was talking about color colors and all this stuff this gives me insight into how perception is of course from six density there is no such thing as colors they just know we see colors because we're humans and we have decoding devices called eyes that interpret uh frequencies of energy and vibration in terms of colors, um, hues of colors. So, see, they make this mistake very often when they say uh, green or blue or yellow or even orange and red, I believe. And, um, you know, it's, it, they're trying to use words that to them uh, make no sense, but referring to a specific portion of what they perceive. And so they're making um, their um, their explanation here, saying that their difficulty lies in their perception of red ray and violet ray being fixed. That's what they see. They see the end sides of our spectrum of beingness, because those are the ones that matter for harvest uh, for harvestability. So you say, does the inner rays, anything in between violet and ray? is it's kind of like you know a mix that is going on it's almost like the music playing whereas this you know to i mean just for visualization it's like the string you know that is attached to a to a music instrument it's you know it's fixed at those two points and depending on how you know tight they are then you can see you know what type of um frequency it's playing so we are doing the same thing and they can only see those two so uh the frequency or the vibration that is caused by the chord, I'm just making this up here, uh, can be perceived as a vibration that is, you know, changing all the time. And that's why they say, they say the inner rays are those which are varying and are to be observed as those indications of seniority in the attempts to form a harvest. So I would say the, um, when you, when you strike a chord or um, a string, um, then you know, that emit, emits a sort of uh, sound, and that sound is what they're seeing. Oh, okay, you know, that sound, it sounds like you are ready for harvest, or it sounds like you're not ready for harvest. But the in between all those, then, you know, they, they don't see them very well. Uh, they can, they probably need to analyze it too much. I don't know. It's just, just a macro perspective of how they perceive things. So in any case, hope that makes sense, my whole analogy with the string and the <laughs> musical instrument. So Don says, question 34, 16, would the red ray, an intense red ray, then be used as an index for seniority? Seniority system of incarnation, as well as the intense violet ray. Here, Ron's gonna give us more insights. Ron says, this is partially correct. In the graduation or harvesting of fourth 
to fourth density positive, the red ray is seen only as that which, being activated, is the basis for all that occurs in vibratory levels, the sum of this being violet ray energy. So before we go any further here, again, see, uh, now not so much from the instrument perspective, but from, well, the instrument that we are, red ray being the uh, the, the foundation of it, you know, Malduk, the, uh, or Mar Malkut is um, uh, its name, and uh, red ray, energy center, the ground, grounding uh, energy center, that's what's allowing energy flowing through the rest of our energy system. If that is bright, then it means that there is a lot of energy. But if the mix is all messed up up here, then the violet ray can be sort of weak. So, um, you know, the, it, that balance is really what they're looking for. You know, when they, when they see the sum, which is the violet ray, they see the origin and they see the sum of all the vibration that occurs in, um, in the energy centers. Orange, yellow, green, blue, uh, indigo. So they say in graduation or harvesting to four density positive, the red ray is seen only as that which being activated is the basis for all that occurs in vibratory levels. The sum of this being violet ray energy. Important point here, they're talking about positive harvesting. Positive is uh, concentrated in, the, uh, in all of them, all the five other energy centers because you need energy flowing through them and going to the heart and through uh, your throat chakra and indigo ray. So it needs to be flowing, it needs to be balanced and vibrating well within harmony there. So that's important to keep in mind. Again, red and violet are fixed because they they cannot go uh, distorted in, in, uh, in too much of a sense. Violet ray gets distorted only because of, you know, the nature of the distortions in the other energy centers. So it's a reflection of those. Whereas, you know, every other, other energy center has distortions of its own, not violet ray. And red ray is just allowing the energy to flow. So, Ross says, the violet, this violet ray is the only consideration for fourth density positive. In assessing the harvestable fourth density negative, the intensity of the red as well as the orange and the yellow rays is looked upon quite carefully, as a great deal of stamina and energy of this type is necessary for the negative progression it being extremely difficult to open the gateway to intelligent infinity from the solar plexus center. This is necessary for harvest in fourth density negative. Okay, now the difference is that, remember, the negative closes or shuts the heart completely so it can energize the lower energy centers. So now red ray plays a more important role in terms of how intense that is because that will also reflect upon the other two. You have to have a very intense, uh, like all your energy is being retained there, sustained there. And you're not allowing the heart to open at all. So all the energy that you're harnessing, you are using for negative orientation, which is again, closing the heart, love of the self, which is all concentrated in perception of self and group or manipulating others for the self. So it's almost like you're, uh, regurgitating the whole energy into a small radius uh, field here or um, diameter. And then they say um, there is a great deal of stamina and energy that is necessary to open the gateway to intelligent infinity. Gateway to intelligent infinity, it's up here, the spiritual. So get into, getting into the spiritual communication with intelligent infinity requires a lot of energy use in the lower energy centers starting or uh, from the solar plexus, they, they say. I guess that's the highest energy center they can achieve and from there, and obviously, you know, manipulating others, that's how you end up um, crystallizing, I guess, the, uh, the yellow energy center so you can progress as a negative. This is ne necessary for harvest and for density negative. Uh, this is really important because otherwise they won't be able to sustain um, the, the vibrations of love and understanding that's a that's a question that i get sometimes like how can you know negative who are not loving uh can, can get to fourth density well they're not loving with others but they're extremely loving with themselves so they can definitely go to fourth density negative uh love for self and continue to polarize there because now they have control over you know social memory complexes if they want not control but they could you know, go up in the hierarchy that they established so they can have their own social memory complex sort of 
uh, like the Orion group has. So anyhow, um, it's a good side question that Don had there. So Don continues and says, is it possible for you to use as an example our general Patton and tell me the, the effect that war had on him in his development? Ross says, this will be the last full question of this working. The one of whom you speak, known as George, was one in whom the programming of previous incarnations had created a pattern. I love how they say George. Um, <laughs> just like I said George before. Or inertia, which was irresistible in its incarnation in your time space. This entity was of a strong yellow ray activation with frequent green ray openings and occasional blue ray openings. However, it did not find itself able to break the mold of previous traumatic experiences of a bellicose nature. I'm just going to finish this. Um, this entity polarized somewhat towards the positive in this incarnation due to its singleness of belief in truth and beauty. This entity was quite sensitive. It felt a great honor duty to the preservation of that which was felt by the entity to be true, beautiful and in need of defense. This entity perceived itself as a gallant figure. It polarized somewhere towards the negative in its lack of understanding the green ray it carried with it, rejecting the forgiveness principle which is implicit in universal love. Finally, Ra says, the sum total of this incarnation, vibrationally, was a slight increase in positive polarity but a decrease in harvestability due to the re rejection of the law, of the law or way of responsibility, that is, seeing universal love yet it's still fought on. So, General Patton, World War II, um, uh, General, of course, he, um, I'm not too familiar with uh, his, with his story. Um, by the looks of it, he had, obviously, I mean, this is Ross' perspective, so it knew more about him in, in this sense than anybody else, I suppose. Uh, he was, he had, first of all, he had, previous incarnations where he was um, he had traumatic experience in terms of war so uh, because of that he was oriented again towards war but in this incarnation last incarnation um, and we'll find out more about that in the next and final question um, he found the possibility of uh, seeing love seeing beauty you know and his direction was towards you know preserving that beauty that he found so it sounds to me like he uh, he kind of opened the perception of what is real in the world, what is universal love and caring for those things. So he did open, he had frequent openings of the green ray, I believe they said. Um, so it's almost like at moments he would say, wow, you know, this is, this is really worth fighting for, you know, or really worth uh, fighting for, not in war, but, you know, just preserving it. Maybe he associated, you know, with his, you know, um, act in, in war. So, um, uh, he had those rejections, uh, not rejections, we'll get to the re rejection in a little bit. Uh, it polarized someone positive in the incarnation because he saw those possibilities of love, of course. He, he was quite sensitive, which again, that seems to be a programming from the higher self to me, uh, being quite sensitive to, to certain things. It felt a great honor duty to the pres preservation of that which is true and beautiful and in need of defense, of course. Um, he preserved, I, <laughs> this I know, there was somebody who um, later on, I think it was in the 60s or 70s, I remember reading that, uh, they said he was um, he was quite arrogant. And I, I guess that's what Ross is saying, what he perceived itself as a gallant figure. I mean, arrogant, just very egocentric. Like he, he had a, not in a bad way, of course, but just, you know, he had a good sense of self, you know, that ego self. Um, it polarized somewhere towards the negative because, see, he didn't, he rejected that. And this is why the next uh, phrase when they say that rejection of the law or way of responsibility, they use law and way interchangeably, Ra. Um, so the law of responsibility is something that you acquire once you, once you, uh, once you feel love and you understand the mechanics or nature of love, then you're responsible for that. Um, this also is applied with um, with higher understandings. When you expand your consciousness, you are responsible for that uh, expressing of consciousness, for 
making that consciousness available to um, to others to radiate it let's just put it that way to radiate that I'm not gonna say you know share it with others or do a specific activity but to radiate it so you are responsible for that if you're not then you're not following the law of responsibility imagine you learn something and you need to share it you feel this urge to share it but you have too many blockages because you feel insecure or whatever uh, and you know it's gonna benefit other people but you don't then you're not following the law of responsibility. So uh, general pattern polarized towards a positive because it was able to see the uh, universal love in its incarnation. And you know that's some positive polarization because you're now seeing it. And you're able to you know, say, wow, you know, this is new for me in my soul stream. Um, but a decrease in, um, in harvestability because of the rejection of those things that it learned. So the next time that he incarnates, and we'll get to that right away, where uh, Don says, do we have enough time for me to ask if the death almost immediately after the cessation of the war of this entity, could that have been so that it could be immediately reincarnated to possibly make harvest? And Ra says, this is precisely correct. A couple of things we can get here, just to finish up with Patton. Um, he, he died immediately after the war, probably, I think it was within a year or two, a uh, car accident, and he, um, I think the other people were safe, and he died, I, I don't remember correctly, but um, he died, he died immediately after the war, and I mean, he took, he was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, I believe, until he eventually died, and he was, uh, I mean, his reflection of self, he said it was, it was a horrible way of dying or whatever, but you, you can see now, based on what Ra says, and the question that Don asked was basically, um, did he die right away after the war so he can incarnate again and kind of fix those things and have uh, increase his possibility for harvest? And Ra says this is precisely correct. He died so he could be harvested or work towards harvesting um, by a, a quick incarnation, reincarnation, which he did. So General Patton was back or is still back with us here in another body. Uh, isn't that awesome to think and know? <laughs> Just to have uh, somebody like that that we know from historical uh, background. This is why it's so important for you to not know who you were in the, your past life. It, imagine this person associating himself or herself with, you know, journal Patton and feeling, oh my God, I was that person. How am I going to judge it? Who knows? So, um, and the other thing is how that we can see here, and I'll, I'll finish, you know, the, uh, before the conclusion, is that um, we have a sort of uh, self-correcting mechanism. I don't even want to call it self-correcting mechanism, but the higher self is always looking at, you know, what is the progress of the entity and see how it programmed really fast for his death so he can be reincarnated again especially since we're coming close on harvest, you know, and he was probably, you know, at the point of being harvested uh, because of his frequent green ray opening. So he had uh, a good possibility there. Seniority, of course, of incarnation was at play. So I'm assuming he was there. Uh, so much to get out of this, but just, you know, the, the, the mechanism that exists between higher self and the incarnation and the soul stream as it's being ga uh, gathered, you know, <clears throat> all the information is being gathered for polarization. So that's um, it's a good insight. Conclusions now. We finished session 34 and we, um, we discuss a lot of catalyst information. Not that this is the last time we're going to talk about it. I forget if in session 35 we're going to discuss it or not. But uh, so far, we've got a lot of information about catalyst as it is in our lives. And what is it supposed to be? Um, again, you know, we, we explore the possibilities of having catalysts through um, gadgets and the war or uh, war, rumors of war, uh, ourselves and societal self and other selves, which we know basically how that works. In essence, anything that is available to us to process that can be an experience that gives us some sort of challenge. That's the thing, a challenge to our beingness, to how our we perceive ourselves and other selves. That is precisely what we're here for. We are here mostly to polarize, and we're not here exactly to do that, otherwise we're failing. It's just that 
you know, to use our time here, you know, smartly or, or wisely is to be aware of that. I'm not saying, you know, go, not that you will go, but, you know, it's the people should go on the streets and start finding catalysts, you know, getting some signs and saying, I need catalysts, provide catalysts to me, please. <laughs> you know, it will come to you. Your higher self is there. That is the beauty of communicating with your higher self and saying, all right, you know, what is the next thing in line that I need to process for me to liberate myself from the conditioning that I have from previous incarnations and from this incarnation? Could be a trauma as a child. It could be, you know, uh, a trauma. Again, I'll use the word trauma, especially because this session used it uh, for, you know, at work could be whatever, anything that you carry or a perception, a wrong perception that you carry from whatever that will provide you for uh, with the experience that you need. Just trust it. Trust that what's happening to you is what you need at the moment. And how do you process it? See the love in it. See how you can find love and wisdom in it. Uh, how you can you relate to the experience, the person and say, OK, based on my own understanding and wisdom, you don't have to go and say, I got to search, you know, how do I deal with a psychopathic boyfriend? <laughs> you, know, you could. Well, how do you want to deal with it? How does your heart tell you? You know, don't it's good to find help in other people, but try to foster, you know, and nourish the, the, the help that you have in you. Nobody's more correct than yourself. So why not use it? So with that, um, I mean, there's so much we can talk about programming, especially programming and how Catalyst is presented here and manifested. But that's the general gist that I want to share today. With that, we finished session 34, session 35 is next week. Uh, again, I didn't do my research, so I need to read it again and find out what we have. Uh, but with that being said, thank you so much for watching as usual, a whole hour. I'll see you in session 35.